Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the subject of civil disobedience in our continuing study of biblical ethics. Two extreme positions. One on the, on the left, we have anarchism, which seeks to overthrow every law and say, let's not have law at all. The, the opposite, polar opposite of that would be uh, what I'm calling radical patriotism, where it says, always obey the law, my country, right or wrong. And notice these two are in tension. In the, in the middle would be the, what I think is the biblical uh, principle of submission, which says sometimes, and, and maybe even usually, obey the law, um, that we are to be in submission to the law, and yet, and yet there are going to be exceptions to that. First Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and following, gives us the basic principle. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Uh, for such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now notice that last verse in verse 15. Uh, there, it, this recognizes that sometimes the people in authority even might be foolish men. They might be making bad decisions. And yet in spite of that, Peter tells his readers to obey, to submit yourselves uh, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Uh, kings, governors, not just elected officials, but the, all those that are in authority because they have been established. The, the idea of authority has been established by God. That's not to say that God um, endorses everything that this particular king does or that particular governor does. No, sometimes they can do some, some bad things. And that brings up the question, when to disobey because the 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 scriptures themselves make it clear there are times to disobey the government. Uh, you see that example in, in a number of places. For example, uh, look at Exodus chapters 1 and 2 and, and the whole early part of the book of Exodus where the Israelites, um, they disobeyed Pharaoh. Uh, they were not putting people to death like their, children, their firstborn children to death like they were told to by the Pharaoh. They were hiding them like Moses was hidden as a little child. And, and so there are times. Uh, here's, there's a conflict, though, as to when to disobey the government. First of all, the anti-promulgation position. Uh, this position says to disobey the government when it passes a law that is contrary to the scriptures. As opposed to the anti-compulsion position, this says disobey the government when it commands the Christian to act in a way contrary to the scripture. Now, that, that sounds at first glance like it might be two different ways of saying the same thing, but it's not. Notice, in one situation, the government passes a law uh, that's contrary to the scripture, and that doesn't mean you have to, that, that doesn't mean you have to uh, do something wrong. But for example, uh, in, in our nation right now, in the United States, um, abortions are legal. Do I disobey the government when I, uh, you know, the government hasn't, hasn't said you must have an abortion, but it has, it, has, has made, it has made abortion legal. So therefore, do I rebel against the government? No, I just don't, I just don't participate in an abortion. So that's the anti-compulsion position. I disobey the government when it commands Christians to act in a way contrary to the scripture, not when it just allows people to, you know, to maybe b behave in a wrong way, but that's not sufficient grounds to disobey the government. The anti-promulgation position would say when it permits or, in, or even endorses, notice those aren't the, the, the same thing. They are two different things. Um, and so these are maybe different variations of that anti-promulgation uh, position. When it either permits or endorses evil, and I think there are countries, my own included, that, do, that is currently doing that sort of thing as opposed to the anti-compulsion position, which says when it commands us to do evil. You see, if the government commands you to do something wrong, don't do that, don't do that wrong. Uh, you're to obey a higher authority. You're to obey God rather than men. In the anti-promulgation position, when the government passes evil laws, it is claimed by some um, that, that uh, we, should, we should therefore overthrow or disobey the government. The anti-compulsion position would say, no, when it compels evil actions, that's one thing. 
but you might have evil laws but you know they're they're allowing you to do things that are wrong but they're not making you're not compelling that kind of action the anti-promulgation position says when it limits freedom we should we should therefore rebel uh, case in point would be the American Revolution uh, revolting against the government the English government uh, the anti-compulsion position and there were people uh, in that American Revolution that 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 said no when it negates freedom and yet you know people still had a um, you know a, a modicum of freedom yes they had to pay high taxes well guess what we still pay taxes today when it negates freedom in the anti-promulgation position says when it's politically oppressive the anti-compulsion position would say when it is religiously impressive in other words when it's telling you don't worship God you have to worship in some other way well Christians uh, should and ought to have a problem at that point now here's one example the example and I already mentioned this in passing the example of abortion in the anti-promulgation position the law allows abortion. Should you therefore rebel against the government? One holding to the anti-compulsion position would say, no, the law doesn't command abortion. And it, that's not saying the government's right, but it's saying I should still, I should still obey the government. doesn't mean I have to endorse um, their, their bad decision, but I still obey the government because it has not commanded me to do something that is wrong. Another issue would be, and I, I made mention of this already, the American Revolution, the anti-promulgation position said, oh, uh, uh, taxation without representation, therefore we must, we must rebel. The anti-compulsion position is seen in Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4 and chapter 5 when the Jewish authorities called the apostles in and said, you must stop talking about Jesus. And they said, we can't do that. You know, we're, now we're, we're obeying the government in all other areas, but we're going to disobey in that particular area. Gandhi, now he's not a Christian, um, he was teaching that civil disobedience becomes a sacred duty when the state becomes lawless and corrupt. Well, there have been a lot of states that have been lawless and corrupt, including the, the Roman Empire, in the days of the early church and yet we saw Peter urging Christians to obey the government I mean it now it's, it's different if it's if it tells you to do something that's contrary to God's law then d disobey in that area and be ready to accept the consequences another good voice now here here is a voice from from a Christian one has moral responsibility this is Martin Luther King uh, to disobey unjust laws and and he was speaking specifically about the, the the racist laws within the United States in the 1960s and I think a point well taken because this was this was a nation claiming to be a Christian nation but not acting very Christianly in its laws now once it once it has been seen that there are times when a Christian is called to, to disobey the government we ask the next question how do we do that and and Geisler points out two areas revolt versus refusal in the area of revolt that can be a very violent and, and usually would be a revolts are violent uh, for example the American Revolution uh, Americans went to war although not Amer all Americans agreed to do that and there were some who said no we ought to take a nonviolent approach uh, again we use the example of Martin Luther King um, in revolt that's that's a fight versus perhaps fleeing you know flight uh, running away from the situation um, in the area of revolt uh, to reject its punishment as opposed to what I see in in Christian circles for example in in the book of Acts there were times when Christians accepted the punishment of the church or I'm sorry of the government uh, when they when they refused to obey the unjust laws now let's look at some biblical examples first of revolt and there are some biblical examples for example Sodom and Gomorrah revolted against Caterleum or kings of the east uh, as a result they came down and conquered both Sodom and Gomorrah and the, and the other cities of the of the valley there of the plain 
Uh, of course, Abraham rescued them. It, it worked out in, on their behalf. Uh, another example of revolt is Absalom's revolt against his father, King David. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15, God does not endorse it. In fact, God works against that revolt and ultimately brings about the death of Absalom. Uh, there's the revolt of Jeroboam against uh, well, uh, first of all, against Solomon, but he is forced to flee from that. Um, and then after Solomon's death, the ten northern tribes actually revolt. Now, God has, he allows this to happen. This is actually of God because of the sin of Solomon. And so this revolt takes place. It's not that he's uh, you know, endorsing everything that Jeroboam does. And then Jeroboam actually ends up taking that in a very bad way and leading the Israelites into some, some bad worship to, to worship Gold, you know, the statues of calves and, and idolatry. Um, there is Hezekiah's revolt against Sennacherib of Assyria, where he has come under uh, Assyria's sway and is paying very heavy taxation uh, to Assyria, and, and then he revolts against Sennacherib according to 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 7. Uh, finally, there is Zedekiah's revolt. Uh, in the case of Hezekiah, he's protected by God. Uh, Zedekiah uh, is, is sinning, and he's warned by, by Jeremiah uh, to, con to return to get the Lord, and he revolts against Nebuchadnezzar, and Jerusalem is destroyed uh, in, in that revolt. Um, not the best examples. Uh, of course, when we think about revolts, one of the revolts that takes place is prophesied in the Bible, not, not described, uh, because by the time it takes place in 70 AD, where the Jewish people revolted against Rome, and that brought about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, um, a, a, um, a, a sad time. And in a sense, perhaps you can see that as, as judgment uh, 40 years earlier. Uh, the, the Jewish authorities, not all the Jewish people, but the Jewish authorities have been saying uh, at the trial of Jesus, his blood be upon us and upon our children 40 years later a as a result of this revolt. Uh, they are conquered and many, many uh, people die and the rest are carried off into captivity. Now, we turn now to some biblical examples of not revolt, but of refusal. Uh, for example, the Pharaoh uh, has ordered the midwives that all Hebrew male children are to be put to death. Um, and we looked at this last time when we were talking about the area of, of lying. Um, and they do that, but, but it's also something of a revolt. Uh, not an armed revolt. They are refusing to carry out the Pharaoh's orders. And, and they're not doing this, this immoral thing of putting these children to death. Uh, the Pharaoh and the parents of Moses. Now, th this isn't personal in which, in which they've come before the Pharaoh, but he has issued an, a proclamation. All male children are to be put to death, and they have a male child, and they don't put him to death. Uh, now, it's, it's sort of humorous almost. I think maybe it's meant to be, where he says they're all to be thrown into the river, and they actually obey the letter of the law. Uh, they take their newborn child, Moses, and they put him into a basket in the river. Uh, of course, with the babysitter, so he won't float away. No harm will come to him. Uh, but that you could call that a a uh, a refusal uh, to obey the law. Of course, it's an unjust and it's a wrong law. The uh, the refusal of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in Daniel chapter three. Uh, now we're not told what Daniel was doing during that time. He's just not mentioned in that chapter. But they refuse to bow down and to worship a an idol that has been established, and they are thrown into the fiery furnace as a result of that. Uh, likewise, we see Daniel and a prayer ordinance that comes out. This time he is mentioned, his friends are not. Daniel chapter 6, where uh, an ordinance comes out th that you know people are only to pray uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel refuses to do that, and instead he is praying to God, and and he is thrown into the lion's den. So you have two rescue narratives. Uh, they're, they're sort of in parallel, although there's some chapters between them. You have the rebuilding of the temple. You say, wait a second, didn't they have permission? Yes, they did initially, but then that permission was rescinded after the death of Cyrus the Great. Um, some some details happened, and, and they were told, stop the uh, reconstruction of the temple. And then in Ezra chapter 5, two prophets get up, uh, Haggai uh, uh, and Zechariah, uh, 
and they they prophesy and they say of course you have to read their prophecies to see what's being said but they get they give the message from god saying start the rebuilding of the temple finish it up and even though they don't have permission from the authorities in persia they obey god rather than men and of course that all works out where an investigation is made and charges are made and but ultimately the emperor of persia says Wait a second, they had permission way back, uh, you know, from, from my granduncle Cyrus, so therefore they can continue and they are allowed to complete the temple. It has a, it has a nice ending. The, you could, I guess, call this sort of a, uh, not a revolt, but a, maybe a, a revolt or a refusal, where Herod had, had ordered the Magi who came into his country looking for the Messiah. He, he had said to them, come back and tell me where he is when you find him. And they don't do that. They, they're warned by God in a dream. They obey the dream. They obey the voice of the Lord. And they go a different way. So you could call that a refusal as well. And finally, the example we already looked at, the apostles and the Sanhedrin, that's Acts, Acts chapters 3, 4, and 5, where they're called before the high court of Israel, and, and the apostles are told, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they say, we can't do that. We, we have to obey God rather than than you. Proverbs chapter 24, verses 21 and following, sets the pattern. My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those who are given to change. We're going to look at that translation in just a second. For their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that comes from both of them. Now, the New International Version, I think, perhaps captures the idea behind these words even though the words themselves are accurately rendered in the New American Standard that we just read. But the NIV says, Fear the Lord and the King, my son, and do not join with rebellious officials. Those given to change is seems to be sort of a euphemism, sort of a, a figure of speech describing rebellion. And notice in verse 22, For those two will send sudden destruction on them, and who knows what calamities they can bring. And so it's a proverb against against rebellion. 